up guys and welcome back to Monique. If you guys are new here then what is up? My name is Erica. Hey, how you doing? And if you're into the history of the ancient Greeks and the Romans, maybe you're just into the mythology and maybe, maybe you're just here to hear about Circe in Greek myth. Well, this is not only the video for you, this is also the channel for you. You guys are going to want to hit that subscribe button and the bell icon so that you know every single time I post in the future. But on topic of today's video, and as you can see from the title, we're going to be going into the Odyssey, book 10. So if I could summarize book 10 into a one sentence, it would be that Circe finally makes her debut in Greek myth. Yes, that's exactly what is the most important thing of this book as well, which is wonderful because that doesn't normally happen when I summarize books. So that's the most important thing. It's a thing that you really need to take away from this. It's not the only thing that happens in this book, so I will have to, you know, go through some of the more boring things for you guys. Um, some things just to help you guys follow the story of Odysseus' journey home to Ithaca. Um, so in saying that, why don't we just roll into the narrative? So where I left you in book nine was on the back end of the whole like Cyclops incident, right? And it like wasn't good as we all know that was like a total sh show. So the men then had to stop off on this other island at the end of last book they sort of recuperate there and then they start sailing again now at the beginning of this book they actually go to somebody else's island not Cersei's first they actually make two stops before Cersei's island so the first stop is they go and see this king called Aeolus I don't actually know if that's how you pronounce it this is how you say his name I had one teacher once who called him Aeolus and it has never ever left me but if you are Greek then please do correct me in the comments I always pin those comments when you guys like write things out phonetically and you're like <laughs> you're butchering this help us all I love it anyways they go to Aeolus's palace and they stay there for a month basically very long story short they stay there for a month and he's really hospitable to them like the men really love staying there and when he sends them all home when he sends them back on their boats to then go and sail back to Ithaca he gives Odysseus a gift this is like normal in hospitality and the gift that he gives him is this bag full of winds now you might be like that's a really weird gift what the hell does that mean basically Aeolus was also the king of the winds so he has power of all of these different winds like from all quarters like north east south and west so he puts a little bit of all of them into a bag and then he gives them to him as a gift which I think is genuinely one of the nicest gifts that Odysseus has ever gotten ever at any point in this book that to me is the most magical most incredible and Odysseus is like wow this is literally like the nicest thing ever goes back on the boat puts the little bag you know below deck or wherever the other gifts are and the men start sailing off they sail off to Ithaca and they sail for nine days and nine nights so they are on the sea for a long time and Odysseus doesn't sleep the entire time okay well he you know doesn't sleep properly the entire time because obviously you can't go nine days and nine nights without actually sleeping but on the ninth night he can start seeing Ithaca in the distance right he can start seeing the smoke coming up from the houses and he just has like this sense of relief where he's like okay now I can rest because now I know that at least we're close to home because they've been through a lot up until this point. This isn't even like halfway through the journey. Like he has no idea what he's gonna have to do in the future. But regardless, he feels a little bit safer now going to sleep now that he can see Ithaca in the distance. So he goes to take a nap. And unfortunately, even as he's telling the Phaeacians this, he's like, this was my biggest mistake was closing my eyes and going to sleep. This is not the only time that it causes him complete havoc, by the way. <laughs> as he's asleep though, the men decide that this is their time to like bitch about their captain, right? And they're just like, look, when we go home, home is right there, when we get there, what are we going to be known for? Are we even going to be known? Like Odysseus is the famous one. Odysseus is the king. He ends up with the majority of the gifts. He ends up with like all of the fame, all of the fortune, all of the, you know, just everybody knows what he's done. He's going to get credit for this entire journey. And what do we get? So they decide to go and investigate all of his gifts because they want to know exactly what he's going home with so that they can be even more bitter about it. And they come across Aeolus's gift, which is obviously the bag of winds. And so instead of being like, well, this is clearly sealed with this like really nice silver ribbon, which is like, you know, from Zeus and all of this, instead of just leaving it, we're gonna open it. And so they open the bag of winds and all the winds come bursting out and the ship just starts you know, going in the opposite direction to Ithaca. They can just start seeing it going off into the distance and they're like, no, home. And obviously Odysseus wakes up and he is pissed as hell as anybody would be in this situation because now Ithaca is not in sight, which is great. So the boat ends up being steered by the winds back to Aeolus' palace. And so Odysseus gets off the boat and he goes back to the king and he explains the situation, basically being like, my men are quite honestly, and I don't know what, I don't know what else to tell you. They opened the winds, we ended up back here, I need your help again. Aeolus though, not having any of this. In fact, he thinks that this is sign that Odysseus is cursed. And so he's like, absolutely not. You leave, get off the island. We're not even having you here for one night. And understandably from his point of view, he thinks that it's like the gods have cursed him. So he doesn't want to be on the bad side of the gods, let alone on the bad side of a curse. And so Odysseus and his men are pushed from shore. So they end up sailing off, right? And the next island that they come across is the island of the Lystragonians. Now, again, we need to remember that he is telling the story in hindsight so he knows the Lystragonians are there at the moment obviously when he washes up to the island he has no clue who lives there so he has no idea what 
him and his men are about to come across with the Lystragonians. Again, I don't know if you pronounce it Lystragonians. It's spelled like this though. A Greek person, correct that in the comments as well. Please help us all. So they arrive on this island and it's super duper rocky. And so Odysseus climbs up to the top of this rock and he can see that there are like all of these little fires and all of this. So he knows that there are people there. Goes back down to his ship and he's just like, three people are gonna go and investigate these people. So there's always two people and then one like Herald who then runs back to like tell the men like what's going on whilst the other two handle the situation with the people. So he sends three of them to go. The three of them go and they end up finding this girl outside of the city-ish area. Find this woman and the woman is like, funny, you should have found me. I'm actually the princess of this island. What you're gonna wanna do is go over to that palace. That's where my parents live and they will help you there. And the men are like, amazing. This has just worked out really nicely for us. So they walk over to the palace and in there is the queen. And actually she's like this really big woman to the point where she terrifies the crap out of the men. And I don't mean that she's fat, like she's just a big, woman like <laughs> she's just a big strong woman so the men are a bit like oh my god okay and she receives them really hospitably and then she says i'm gonna call my husband though and he'll get together like a feast and everything like that for you guys so she goes to call the king the king walks in the king you know says hello to them <laughs> it's like hey guys what's up no problem you can totally stay here i will start preparing your welcome meal for you and your men and instead of doing what we would expect him to do which would be like i don't know to find like a sheep or a goat or a cattle i don't know something he instead runs over to odysseus's men picks one of them and like tears him limb from limb on the spot so that he will be the feast. So they are cannibals. Remember how in the last book I said that they had called Polyphemus a cannibal? These people, the Lystragonians, legitimate cannibals. So as you can imagine, the other two of Odysseus's men are like, what the f is going on. So they leg it appropriately. They leg it out of the palace and they're running back and all the Lystragonians are like chasing them with all of their spears and they're trying to kill them. The men run back to the ships, they get back on the boats and they're screaming to all of Odysseus' men and they're just like, start going now because if we don't row now, we're all gonna die. And in fact, the Lystragonians spear so many of the men that only, only Odysseus' boat makes it off the island like safely because he has a bunch of them still with him. And only the one manages to make it away. The Lystragonians spear all of the other men and kill all the other people on the boats, which is terrifying. And no one talks about this episode enough, like the trauma of these cannibals chasing these men and then killing the majority of them and only having Odysseus and like 40 of his men at this point, they make it off the island alive, which is, I don't even, I just can't. But that is the Lystragonian episode. From there they sail on and now we're gonna get to Circe. Okay, so the next island that they go to is an island by this name. I have absolutely never been able to pronounce it. I have no idea because it's A-E-A-E-A. -E -A -E -A. That's just, it's only vowels. I just, I don't know what the stress is at all. I've read it in the Greek as well and I'm like, I don't, I don't even know if my mouth can make those sounds. But either way, that's the island that they show up to. Odysseus notices he's telling the story to the Phaeacians that they are going to come into contact with this woman called Circe. And even though she looks like a mortal, she sounds like a mortal. She's not because her brother is King Aetes. Now that's an important mythological note because that means, and this is highlighted as well in the book, that Circe is the daughter of Helios, who is the sun titan god. The <laughs> God, that was terrible. The Titan Sun God. Okay, so the guy, as I've mentioned in the previous book, I mentioned when Demodocus sang about it, that Helios is the person who moves the sun across the sky. That is her father, which means that her niece, because King Aetes' daughter, is Medea. Okay, for those of you who don't know who Medea is, it's not really that important, but either way. So she's related to Medea. And on the other side, her other sister is this woman called Pasiphae, who's also the daughter of Helios. That's her sister and Pasiphae's daughter, because she ends up marrying the king of Crete is Ariadne. So this is like a very famous family. Okay, just to create some mythological context, this is not just Circe's really great. Like Circe's, both of Circe's nieces are very, very important figures to myth, because on one side we have Medea and Jason's whole whole Argonaut thing and that whole issue that goes on there. And on the other side, we have Theseus and Ariadne, all related to Circe. But anyways, let's just, <laughs> let me just explain what happens on Circe's island. So they arrive on this island and for two days and two nights, they just sort of like chill out on the beach and they're just eating and sleeping and all of this. And when they have sort of recuperated and they have obviously done the whole like grieving thing for the other men that they have just lost on the island of the Lestragonians. Then Odysseus decides to sort of spring into action and he picks up his spear and he goes on this little, little hike, little walk where he finds this lookout point and he ends up seeing the rest of the island and he sees one house. There is one inhabitant of this island. There is one little bit of smoke coming from the house. He's like, all right, someone clearly lives there. And he goes back to his men and he explains what he's seen and he says, all right, we have to go and investigate. He says they're gonna go and do it in the morning though because they should just eat again for that day. And so he ends up like killing this giant deer, this like huge stag. All of the men are like super impressed by this. Now the following morning, Odysseus takes a totally different approach to like exploring the island. Because as we've seen up until this point, 
he has decided to like do this like group of three where like three people will go and like investigate the island he's now just like that clearly hasn't worked for us in the past so now we're just going to split everybody in half right so we've got 22 men on each side there's a leader for each team one is obviously odysseus and on the other side it is this guy called yuri Locus. so odysseus puts both of their lots into a helmet and he shakes it up and he says whoever's we pull out is going to go and investigate you know who that person is on the island and what they need and what they want and all of this and so he shakes it up and out comes yuri Locus's name so yuri Locus takes the 22 of his men i think it's 22 including him actually so the 21 of his men and then they are gonna go to uh to, to visit cersei as the men approach this is kind of where they start getting the heebie-jeebies and like things seem a little bit weird because they approach and there are all of these like wild animals that are totally calm right so we've got like wolves we've got lions that are roaming about and the men initially are quite scared of these animals as they should be because in any other situation they would have been killed by them but because cersei has clearly enchanted them or something they are actually acting more like dogs like dogs who have like seen their masters for the first time in like ages so they sort of run up to the men and they're super friendly and the men are like interesting what in the world is going on? And when they approach the door of Cersei's palace, they can actually start hearing her singing inside. So she's weaving inside, she's at her loom, and she's singing this like beautiful song. Like apparently she has like the voice of a freaking angel. Like it's described that the whole house is echoing back to her as she sings. Like that is how melodic and how wonderful, like breathy her voice is. So all of the men are like totally enchanted by her singing. They're just like, wow, we got to put a face to that voice. Which is weird then when you think that her epithet is actually like Cersei of the Lovely Braid and not Cersei of the lovely singing because apparently she's got really nice hair, but anyways. The men knock on the door. Cersei appears. This wonderful sorceress witch person appears at the door and she's just like, oh my god, guests, they're wonderful. You can come inside. Like, please, let me be so hospitable to you. And the only man who doesn't go inside is Yuri Locus because he can tell that something is fishy. He's not too sure what, but he knows that something's not right. So the other men go in, they sit at the table. Cersei and her handmaidens get together this like beautiful feast, right? Of all of this food and all of this wine that Cersei mixes herself. But she puts all of these little like herbs in it and she puts all of her potions into every single drink, into every single plate of food so that the men are like hocked up on all of this magic, which is not good because then when they finish eating, Cersei then appears with her little wand and she just yells pigs at them and they all just turn into pigs on the spot. 21 of them at this point. They're just little, little cute little pigs with their little snouts. Okay, actually they're not cute. They're described as like fully grown pigs, but I always imagine them as like cute little like cartoon pigs, like really chubby ones as well, like little piglets is more to how I describe them, not how the Greek describes them at all. But they turn into pigs and Cersei then to top the scene all off to make it absolutely hysterical. She then just like corrals them. She like pushes them all into a pen and then just starts throwing seeds at them. <laughs> like literally just treats them like animals immediately. But it is said that actually their minds stay human even though their bodies are pigs. So it's very, I can imagine it's very traumatic for the men even though I do giggle when I read it. Now Yuri Locus can see this happening though, right? Because he's still outside. He sees this happening and he just goes into full panic mode. He is like not doing so well and he sprints back to Odysseus' ships. He gets down there and he just gets down on his knees and he just starts crying. Like he can't even get a word out. He's panicked so much. And Odysseus and his men, they've got to ask him like specific questions so that he can appropriately answer them. Because they're like, I have no idea what's happened. You've just appeared out of nowhere and you're just crying. Like you need to tell us move by move exactly what's gone on. And so eventually he ends up sort of explaining the whole thing that we just read. And obviously Odysseus as being the leader that he is, he sort of jumps up and he's just like, I have to go and investigate then. He asks Eurylochus to show him the way to Cersei's palace. And Eurylochus obviously cannot do it. He is still freaking traumatized. And he's like, please, please don't make me do this. So Odysseus is like, fine, I'm just gonna go by myself. And he starts wandering through the forest. In the forest, he comes into contact with Hermes, right? So the god of messages, he's also the god of travelers. He appears, he meets Odysseus and he's like, hey man, I heard that your men are all turned into pigs. Is that why you're gonna go and investigate the whole Cersei thing? And he's like, actually funny, you should mention that. That's exactly why I'm going inland right now. So Hermes then pulls out this little pouch of his own herbs and he explains, you know, where the herbs are from and what they are. And he says, look, what Cersei is gonna do is she's gonna try and drug you because she's gonna try and use her magic on you. She's gonna try and turn you into a pig, just like the rest of your men. And what you're gonna do is eat these weird little herb things. You're gonna eat them before you go in. And that way they're gonna make you immune to all of her magic. Like it doesn't matter what she then tries on you, you're gonna be fine. And so Odysseus is like, okay, is that all you need to tell me? And Hermes is like, no, I got some more advice for you. So Hermes instructs him that when she pulls out her wand and she tries to turn him into a pig or whatever it is she's gonna do, that then when Odysseus doesn't react, what he has to do is he has to pull out his sword. This is very strange advice. He's gotta pull out his sword, run over to Cersei as if he's going to stab her, like literally like put, the sword up against her neck, <laughs> like like near like a windpipe or something to be like, on guard, which is obviously going to terrify the 
out of Cersei as it would anybody. And then she is going to say, because she's gonna be in such shock, she's then gonna say to him like, oh no, you are about to kill me. You didn't fall victim to any of my potions. You have to come to bed with me and you've got to sleep with me. And Hermes is like, when she says that to you, by the way, you totally have to agree. Like you can't say no, because that's how you're gonna get her to turn your men back into men. Cause they're, you know, pigs. And obviously you're reading this and you're just like, this is the weirdest thing that he's ever said. And Odysseus is even like, are you sure that's what I'm supposed to do? And Hermes is like, I'm positive. And on top of that, the last thing that you'll have to do is before you actually hook up with her, you're going to have to make her like swear this oath that she's not then going to harm you when you're like naked in her bed or anything like that. And Odysseus is like, this sounds like a very questionable experience, but only agreeing to this because you're a god. And then Hermes is like, all right, peace out. And he just then like leaves. He goes back to Olympus and Odysseus is left there holding the drugs. And he's just like, okay. And on he goes, on he goes to Cersei's palace. He ends up at the door. He knocks on the door and Cersei appears and she's like, oh, hospitable and all of this sort of lovely. And she leads him in to where all of the, you know, the table is and all the food is and all the wine is and everything. And she starts mixing all of her own herbs into the food. Now, Odysseus has taken, at this point, he takes his little, little herbs from Hermes. And so he's sitting at the table, he finishes his whole meal, and he hasn't obviously reacted to it, obviously. Cersei pulls out her little wand, Odysseus then pulls out his sword, and he runs over to her as if he's gonna stab her. And he's just like, mwahaha, I am now victorious. Cersei then panics, as we know that she will. She drops to her knees to supplicate Odysseus, which is, you know, to like hug his own knees. And she starts like pleading with him to be like really nice to her. She's like, can you please be really warm to me? and I'm just trying to be hospitable and I'm so sorry about my behavior. But you must be Odysseus. She says, and I wrote down the quote, obviously it's line 66. And she says, Odysseus is a man of twist and turns. And so therefore he must be Odysseus because she has been warned by Hermes previously that a guy called Odysseus is gonna show up and he's not gonna be um, falling victim to her potions. And so then she must sleep with him. Um, because that is what Hermes told her to do, which I think is very interesting because who is it that's really the puppet master in all of this? It's not Odysseus, it's not Cersei, it's Hermes who's watching somewhere with his popcorn being like, I love this. I'm having a lot of fun right now. So Cersei tells Odysseus to put the sword away and she's like, let's just go to bed like right now. And Odysseus, obviously he then asks her to swear the oath and she immediately swears the oath to be like, I promise that I'm not gonna like, you know, kill you in your sleep or like after we hook up, I'm not just gonna like, you know, sprinkle potions on you or anything, like don't worry. So as they go to do the dirty deed over there, the handmaidens, all of Cersei's handmaidens come and they, you know, prepare a whole feast for Odysseus. They, one of them actually prepares a whole bath. Uh, they do bathe him. They anoint him with all of this oil and everything. And then he goes to sit down to go and eat and drink and all of this. And he doesn't touch any of the food. And Cersei notices this. And Cersei's a bit like, are you okay, Odysseus? Like, do you still think that I'm going to be planning this treachery against you? Because like I swore an oath. So like I promise, promise I'm not going to do that. And Odysseus just explains that he cannot enjoy his food because his men are still pigs. And he's like, how do you expect me to sit here and to enjoy all of this luxury when my men are literally, they have snouts. And so Cersei's like, all right, fine. So she goes outside with this little like rub and she rubs it on all of the pigs. And then she's like, be men. And then they all turn into men. But she makes them all like, you know, a little bit taller, a little bit younger than they were before, a little bit like better looking and all of this. And so when they come back into the palace, then they're all like crying and all of this. Like all the men are just like, oh my God, we're humans and they're Odysseus. And Cersei tells Odysseus that what he should do now that his men are, you know, men again, they're not pigs anymore, that he should then go back to the rest of his boats. He should store all of his cargo safely into a cave and he should invite the rest of his men up to her palace to go and stay and all of this. And so Odysseus is like, okay, that sounds like a pretty good deal. Now that my men are men, I can go get the rest of them. So he goes down to the beach. He tells all of the men what's gone on. And obviously all of them are like pretty chuffed by this. They're just like, all right, we get home. We get to stay here for a bit. It should be safe. Wonderful. All of them apart from Eurylochus, obviously who totally challenges Odysseus right now. And he's like, this is going to be a Cyclops 2.0. Point oh, we're all gonna die. We're all gonna be kept hostage here. We're not gonna be able to leave. Men are gonna be sacrificed and I'm not okay with this. Now, Odysseus's first response to this is actually that he takes out his sword because he wants to chop off this guy's head because he's just like, you, I'm the leader and I gave you some orders. But all the other men check him and they're just like, you totally don't have to do that. And so Odysseus sort of checks himself. He looks at Eurylochus and he's like, all right, if you don't wanna come to Cersei's palace, you don't have to, you can stay by the ships, but I'm bringing all the other men. We're all gonna go and we're gonna enjoy ourselves. We're gonna stay in like the lofty halls and all of this. So have fun down here by yourself. And they all just start leaving. They literally just start putting all the cargo into a cave and then they just leave. And Eurylochus obviously ends up following them because it is much better to be with them and to die rather than to just like die alone on the beach and not have any food and all of this. So they all go back to Cersei's palace and actually all the men just start crying when they see each other. Like they are just so overwhelmed and so happy to see one another that they're all just like bawling their eyes out. And even Odysseus is like quite emotional by this. And Cersei says to him that she wishes that he wouldn't cry because she wants him to be as 
uh, comfortable and as confident as he was when he left Ithaca in the first place. Which is a really sweet moment between the two of them. And even though Cersei did start off as being like super duper protective of her space, obviously and turned all of them into pigs, that now we are seeing a much more human side of her, which is cute. Now the men actually end up staying on the island for an entire year and they don't even notice until the seasons start like, you know, like recycling themselves. What is that when they just like start going? Basically they realize it's been a year because they have lived through all the seasons and they're just like, well, we've been here a while, we should go home. So all of Odysseus' men start encouraging him to think of home and they're just like, can you please go and ask Cersei to send us on our way to tell us where to go and all of this because they're sort of like stuck on the island because they don't know where they are and they don't know like geographically where they are in the world and none of this, so they need Cersei's help. So Odysseus is like, okay. And one night he decides when he goes to bed to just supplicate Cersei and he like hugs her knees and he's just like, please, Help me and my men get back to Ithaca because I miss home and I really want to go. And I've just, I've been away for such a long time. And Cersei actually replies in a really wonderful way where she says that she doesn't want to keep them on the island any longer if they're not willingly there. That she's like, obviously I will send you home if you so badly don't want to be here. Like that would be totally inhospitable of me to be like, no, you must stay. So she decides that she's going to send them home. But what she tells Odysseus in this moment is that actually he can't go home just yet. She's like, there's something else that you need to do. And she tells him right now that he has to go to the underworld to talk to Tiresias. Now I will address who Tiresias is and why this instance is so important in the next book because that's book 11. <laughs> so episode 12 of this whole series. But right now, Cersei tells Odysseus sort of all the steps that he has to make and the instructions, like a very long list of instructions being like, you need to make this kind of a sacrifice. You need to then speak to this person. You need to sit around with your sword. You need to make sure that no other spirit comes to talk to you until Tiresias does like all of these rules. All of the stuff that Odysseus does in the next book in book 11, he only does because Cersei gives him this very long list of things to do right now. Now. But the next morning, dawn rises and Odysseus wakes up. Cersei gives him this really nice outfit to put on and she herself puts on this really nice, you know, like robe and all of this and whatever. And he goes down to the men and he says, today is the day, we're gonna leave, woohoo, amazing. And all of the men are like super hyped by this. So they just like run down to the ship, they start loading it up. But as Odysseus is rounding up all of his men, he does notice that one of them is missing. And we find out now that there's this guy called Elpinor who apparently got super drunk one night. He dies in a very mortal way, right? He gets super duper drunk and he climbs up to the roof of Cersei's house to sleep there one night. I imagine that the view is actually quite nice and the stars are quite nice. So like, why wouldn't you do that? But it's a slanted roof. So like, you really shouldn't be doing that. No one ever. But that's what Elpinor does. And obviously when he gets up at one point, like stands up, he's so drunk that he sort of wobbles about and he falls off the roof and he breaks his neck. So it's a very, very mortal way of dying. It's very anticlimactic. You would hope that it would be like this whole magical way of death, but Elpinor just sort of dies that way. But they don't bury him in this moment. That's important. But the reason why this is mentioned is because he's not buried. And we know that doesn't fly in the ancient world. Anyways, cut back to Odysseus and his men getting the ship ready and everything. And that's sort of as they're on the boat, you know, rigging the whole thing and whatever, Odysseus turns to all of them and he's like, by the way, I should probably break it to you that Cersei said, we're not going home right now, that actually we have to go to the underworld first and like pay somebody a visit. And obviously all the men are super upset by this. All the men, they don't start crying, but they're a bit like, are you serious? We just wanna get back to Ithaca. I totally feel for the men at this point, but Odysseus says that when he has gotten onto the boat, what he noticed was that there was a ram already on there and a black sheep. Now those are important because those are two animals that he had to actually sacrifice that Cersei told him to sacrifice. And uh, so clearly Cersei had gotten to the boats before them and just left them there for him. Like she's really doing the most at this point, right? But he doesn't see her do this. And the last line of the book, which I actually love that I had to write it down, like the final line that he says to the Phaeacians is, who can glimpse a god who wants to be invisible gliding here and there? And I don't know why I love that line so much, but I really do. And um, that's the end of the book, that we have Cersei help all the men, we have Odysseus and his men get back on the boat, and they're going to go to the underworld in the next book, which is a very important mythological moment, but that is Cersei. So I hope that if you guys are not currently reading the Odyssey and you just wanted to hear Cersei's episode, that that was um, interesting enough, <laughs> that actually you learned something. Um, Cause I know a lot of you guys who have read Cersei by Madeline Miller are very obsessed with her as a character and want to know where to find her in mythology. And this, this is her moment. That was her moment to shine. It was book 10 of, uh, of, of the Odyssey, which is super exciting. So yeah, thank you guys so much for tuning in. Next time we will be seeing a bunch of souls that we are already familiar with and a bunch of heroes that we're already familiar with who have already died um, in the underworld when Odysseus goes to visit them. But um, yeah, so we'll be seeing you then. Bye.